So I've changed my topic slightly. Uh, I'm turning this around so you can see that it says something meaningless, right? Three things. <laughs> yes. Well, it's now, all right? So here we are, and we're going to be talking about uh, awake beyond your dreams, the idea of, of course, lucid dreaming, as you just heard. Now, my original topic was dreaming, perception, and awakening. And fortunately, all the work for describing those differences has been done for me today. For example, earlier this morning, the first session, uh, we had full descriptions of of what's involved in that. I'd just like to make one point in starting to think about how, as adults, we have come to lose the wonder of the world. So here, this experience of flying, that we are flying in an airplane, having a view that no one in 99.99% of human history ever had. How many people even look out the window? We just say, oh, I know what's going on. Sure, it's flying. I do it all the time. Nothing to it here. So landing. It, well, a safe landing. I survived. Here we are. And you sort of know it all, right? You got this, this view that you've done it before, you understand it, and you know what's going on. <laughs> but no, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you are totally amazed to discover that everything you thought was wrong, that actually you have been asleep in bed and you wake up to realize everything I'm experiencing is a model, this model airplane. Well, it's a model world. And that's what we were hearing this morning. We were hearing the idea that what we're experiencing, the world, is, is actually not the physical world that common sense tells you, but instead it's a mental model in some sense, to use that language. It's something that's a phenomenal experience that's inside us, not out where it appears to be. So what we experience is what we most expect, consistent with current evidence. So expectation, prior probability, there's a lot of different models for this, but this is the one we find useful to understand what goes on in dreams. So dreams, uh, just take a moment, moment to remind us, seem somehow miraculously real. They seem so vividly, as vividly real as this experience we're having right now, that when we ask people like yourselves to say, report on the contents of your conscious experience in the last five minutes, and just a checklist, did you have any one of these uh, sensory experiences, vision, sound, smell, taste, temperature, pain, etc. Checklist. Did the same thing when people woke up from a dream, REM sleep dreams, and asked them to do that. And we found that essentially every sensory dimension that was present in the waking state was also present at times in dream states. There were some differences in the distribution. Pain, for example, seems to be less frequent in dreams. So you're more likely to experience an anesthesia of the skin instead of a painful pinch. And so there's some basis to the pinch test. It's not just the sensory experiences that are the same. Once you're in this dream world, once you're in it, then you're going to find that if we ask the same question, did you have any experience of making a choice, deciding between options, an emotion, public self-consciousness, being aware of how you appear to others, reflecting on events, and all these higher cognitive events, we find that none of them are absent from dreams. So contrary to those people who say that dreaming is necessarily a defective state where we can't think straight, I think the evidence suggests that it's a more variable state than the waking state, where there's a much wider range of possibilities, including, of course, sometimes when you really can't think straight in the conventional ways, at least. Who knows whether you're thinking you know, clearly in some other way, maybe. But other times where it just seems defective. But at the same time, there are moments when you have an incredibly clear insight and, well, lucidity. So the, the, the simple way I have for understanding, formulating what's going on in a dream is going back to the old holodeck. 
I uh, remember Star Trek, they had this little room they could go into, and in that room they could have any imaginable experience that they use for all kinds of different functions, including uh, practice or recreation or learning new skills, uh, enacting art forms, whatever they wanted to do, right? And so that is, I think, the virtual reality simulator, of course, that we have right here on our shoulders, so to speak. And it's a, a more realistic simulator than any computers yet. Uh, it turns out it doesn't take much of uh, an input to take us real, because you remember those video games you used to play 20 years ago that were you know, barely sketched in, yet you sort of believed they really were tanks or whatever they were claimed to be. Now, the, the model that uh, I hope I can just uh, mention now, and you'll accept as reasonable based on all that you've heard already, is that the process of dreaming is extremely closely related to what you're doing right now. Right now, you're all engaged, we're all engaged in a process of perception, where we're seeing things happening. We're perceiving events, people in the audience, people on the stage, words being said, all the rest of the elements of our conscious experience. It's a construction. It's something that we are in some sense building with, we'll call it our, our mind and our consciousness, and I am presuming mostly our brain. Now, I don't, I'm not saying therefore that the brain is the only component of consciousness. There is this awareness question that can be separate, and the problem that being separate and always present is it may be difficult to tell the difference, whether you've got it or not. But that could account for these phenomenal features that are very difficult to explain. But the basic idea is very simple. In the waking state, I see, for example, I, I, I'll illustrate with this cup instead of the glass with the water in it for safety's sake. So, a cup. I see a cup there, right? Everybody sees that cup. No, probably not with that blinking clock. Let's get that out of the way. Distraction. Cup, right? And does every, anybody not see the cup? Okay, cup. All right. So, we, we, we say with a conventional model something like, well, that's because there's something that we all call a cup, meaning we all share the same mm, typical brains and perceptual systems and you know, recognize an object that's familiar to us, ah, it's a cup. But it has to do with the sensory input reflected. If, if suddenly the lights were turned out, you know, and I asked you to do that, you wouldn't have seen what it was. You wouldn't say there's a cup. But now think of this. I'm dreaming there's a cup. I'm drinking dream water from a dream cup. Is there an external cup? No. Only if you think that there's a... Uh, uh, an external world in the dream, like the astral plane, that somehow corresponds to the physical plane. I think, I think it's an unnecessary assumption. The more obvious solution is that we always experience reality in our minds, in our heads, if you like, but certainly in our minds. Phenomenal reality is something that's inside us, not outside us, whether we're dreaming or awake. And the only difference in dreaming and awakening uh, the only essential difference, I should say, is that in dreaming, we have perception going on without sensory input or with very real, little sensory input constraining what we perceive. So if Stephen were dreaming right now, his body would actually be lying inert in bed in some way, flat on the ground. Whereas in his dream, suppose this were his dream, he might be gesturing, doing that miraculous scientific hand-waving we heard about, or was it non-dual hand-waving? But whatever it was, he would be in his phenomenal body, in his dream body, doing something that his physical body wasn't doing, right? So he's not being constrained by the condition of his physical body in the dream. And that's what we mean by dreaming is perception unconstrained by sensory input. And the more unusual way to look at things is to say, but what is this? This that we're doing right now. And the idea is that this is a dream. It's a dream that happens to be constrained by sensory input. So it's 
We're sharing dreams. Each one of you have your own dream of what's going on. They correspond to a certain degree, such as most people that were attending would be able to report what the example object I put on the podium was, right? So we share dreams in this particular case. So moving on to the main idea is, so sharing dreams, well, we can be in a dream, say, this is a dream right now. Something odd happens, like you find that the... Uh, uh, airport attendants are giants or something, and you say, wait a minute, uh, what's going on? Either I'm in Gulliver's Travels or this is a dream. Typically, when anomalous, unusual events occur and you have the mindset to notice them, you can recognize you're dreaming. At least, uh, so, so many of you have experienced that. How, how many people have never remembered having that experience. I say not remembered because that doesn't mean you haven't had it. We forget most dreams. Hands up for people that never had a lucid dream. A few, right? And there's a difference between having a moment of a lucidity and thinking this is a dream, but not doing anything with it, and having an extended lucid dream that you can stay in long enough to reflect on, to think about, say, what am I doing? Where am I? What's going on? And how can this be so real? Now, is this possible? Well, if you listen to philosophers, you find out, and uh, other experts at the time, when I first started having a scientific interest in this topic back in the late 70s, uh, I had been looking for a uh, topic for my PhD at Stanford, and I came upon lucid dreaming as a state that I experienced and was fascinating with that basic question of how can it be that here I am in a world that seems as real as real can be, yet I know I'm asleep in bed. I remember that. I don't feel my body. Well, how can I experience such a rich consciousness without sensory input? And so I went to the libraries and started to read about this and found the first thing is that uh, most sleep scientists thought it didn't happen. It, yes, people report it. See, a lot of people report it. Probably not as many then, but... Certainly people say, yes, I have the experience, but they were skeptical about it. They said, well, this is probably simply a matter of uh, people fantasizing in the night and, or waking up from a dream and thinking about the dream and the next morning falsely remembering what had happened. And it's not an unreasonable hypothesis if you think that you just can't possibly be conscious during your sleep. As Norman Malcolm, behaviorist philosopher, has said, the supposed judgment that one is dreaming is unintelligible and an inherently absurd form of words. It's not just impossible, that it's just, you can't even talk about it sensibly, right? So let's just forget it. Well, quite the, the challenge. So, so here we are, with a situation like that where you've had, you're in a lucid dream, you say, here I am, I'm in a dream, and I know I'm dreaming. I'm pretty sure I know I'm dreaming as much as I'm ever conscious of anything. Here I am. How could I show that to anyone else? It seems as private as private can be. Because uh, there are degrees of private and public in the sense of readily shared or not. I, I, uh, I, I'm not saying that there are any events that are, are essentially private, but our dreams are hard to share. They're hard for us to share with our waking selves. When we wake up, we forget them. But the, the challenge is something like we've got, here's this sleeping gypsy, and he's having a dream, right? Now, how does the scientific observer, this lion, sniffing around the sleeping body of the gypsy in a painting, never mind that, how can he know what is going on in the mind of that gypsy? What is going on in the dream? That seems one of those unbridgeable gaps. And since lucid dreaming was considered impossible because one thought that when you are asleep, you are unconscious. That's, people say that. Uh, therefore, how could you be conscious in your dreams? And the problem is, is that's one of the difficulties we get into, which we've seen in this conference as well as in the last 30 years, that if you don't use consciousness in a very precise way, it can lead to a muddle. And in this case, what we actually mean when we say someone is unconscious when 
asleep, is that a sleeping person will not typically be able to report what goes on in the environment around them, right? So if you're having a conversation or if somebody's asleep during this lecture, when you wake up, you won't know what I said, right? And that's what we mean. But that has nothing to do with whether we are or are not conscious of some internal process of, of a dream, for example. The fact that we can remember our dreams at all as events that occurred to us means that they were not unconscious processes. Because that's the basic distinction for unconscious processes and conscious is that they are in principle reportable. So all dreams are at least conscious experiences. They just don't happen to normally be metacognitively conscious. We are not aware of the fact that we're dreaming any more than we're usually aware of the fact that we're awake. So I was familiar with the research at the time. This is an important principle. I knew what else had been done. And I was aware of this particular kind of studies, that some uh, studies where people would be awakened from REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, the sl stage of sleep in which the most vivid dreams occur for most people. It's cyclical, not all of sleep is like that, every 90 minutes or so. And awakened after they showed this very regular pattern of left, right, left, right eye movements, about two dozen very distinct eye movements. And when he was awakened at the end here and said, what were you dreaming? He said, I was standing at the side of a ping pong table watching a very long volley back and forth goes his eyes. And so this is an unusual dream, but I thought seeing this in my lucid dream, surely I have the ability to look to the left and look to the right and left and right, for example. That's a kind of a simple task. I could do that as a symbolic representation, uh, communication saying, when I realize I'm dreaming, I'm going to make this eye movement signal, and that will say I'm dreaming. And then we can see, does it happen in REM sleep, some other stage of sleep, or in a waking state? Who knows? So that's the basic idea. And so that would be a way of actually connecting what goes on in the dream world to the waking world. As it happens, I probably wouldn't be telling you about this now if it hadn't have worked, which it did. And uh, this is uh, one of uh, our early subjects. Uh, and, and it's a little hard to see this, uh, but I'll say it's the last eight minutes of a 30-minute REM period, a regular solid REM period late in the night. And the three channels that are being displayed are the EEG brainwaves and electrooculogram I'm movements and the EMG muscle tone of the chin. From these three parameters, one can tell what stage of sleep a person is in and whether they're awake or not. Here's a, a, a bit easier to follow uh, of the last six minutes. Now, when the subject woke up at the end of this time over here, he wrote down a report in which he described doing what I'm about to tell you. And in the future, I'll just say subjects did this or did that rather than going through that extra discussion. But he described having made five eye movement signals in the dream report before. The first one, you see at one, five minutes before he wakes up, so in REM sleep, it's all solid REM sleep, he makes a left, right, left, right signal. So he's looking at his left ear, right ear, left ear, right ear. So a strong signal, you can see it looks different looks different from the more random eye movements of REM sleep, where you're not going that far. It's smaller and more random looking. And that was his signal saying, I know I'm dreaming. We had two signals that we asked people to make in this case. One is two pair, left, right, left, right, for I'm dreaming, and four pair for I am awake, right? And sure enough, about a minute and a half after his lucid dream starts, he gives the signal for being awake, right at two, okay? However, it looks kind of like the same physiology before and after, and in fact, that's still REM sleep. So the subject now is having an experience where he is dreaming he is awake, but he's not, right? So just as all of you right now could be doing, right? Not me, because I already did a reality check to make sure I wasn't. <laughs> in which case, I wouldn't be here at all if you were dreaming. So, but, so, in his dream now, he starts to write out his dream report. But, of course, it's in the dream, so it's not going to do us any good. 
But when, uh, after he's getting somewhere, the dream, dream technician comes into the room and starts to tear off his electrodes. They're glued on with the collodion glue that needs to be sort of dissolved with solvent. So this is uh, a violation of human subjects for sure. And, and he said, wait, this has got to still be a dream. And makes a signal at three to indicate that he is dreaming again. And here's a very remarkable, important point. His report says, but I started to make too many eye movements. And I had made three. There's three actually at number three. So I waited a few seconds to repeat the correct signal. And there he makes the two pair for being lucid, the correct signal. And then about uh, almost two minutes later, he wakes up, makes a signal, and wrote out a report in the world that we can share and read and say, yes, that's what we call physical reality, whatever that is, all right? So now from this, we see a number of important things about the study of dream consciousness. One, we can show as well as we can prove anything at all about the physical world that Lucid dreaming happens during REM sleep. It doesn't happen, you know, just in the moment of awakening or something, but five minutes before waking up with uninterrupted REM sleep, the person gave the signal. All of these signals correspond exactly to what we can observe in the record, so we believe that his memory is working all right because he got the signals right, so the rest of what he's saying is more plausible as well. Further, this false awakening signal there uh, is an answer to those people who say, well, the physiology you're finding here must only apply to lucid dreams, not to non-lucid dreams, because, you know, it's different, so, right? But we see the same signals exactly for the false awakening. Finally, the three where he misspoke. I gave the wrong signal. That wasn't what I meant. So wait, and here's what I mean. Shows he is symbolically communicating. It's volitional thinking and high-level cognition. Okay, well, I'm going to have to skip through uh, a lot of this because there's much more. But I just want to say that if there, in case there are any sleep specialists in the audience, uh, say I'm going to quickly show you uh, a counterexample to the inception claim that you never know the beginning of your dream. Uh, and also something that every sleep specialist would recognize as definitely REM sleep. Here are K, are, 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 well, there's a K complex before that, but the sleep spindles, uh, muscle tone of the chins, the stage two sleep. The dream starts with sawtooth waves up there and rapid eye movements and clear onset of REM sleep. And the subject's report was, I was in, lying in bed and the phone rang. We had phones for waking up subjects and I answered it but realized I was actually dreaming. I was so excited, I gave the signal and there you see the left right, left right standard signal. And I was so excited to having succeeded in this task of communicating with the other dimension, as it were, that I did it again more carefully and slowly. So see, it's emotional experience, but definitely in REM sleep. Still, skeptics said, can't happen. All of those eye movements in REM sleep just could be chance. So we've tried other channels, other ways of communicating, uh, for example, with muscle uh, contractions of the forearms. Most of the muscles of uh, vocalization and locomotion in the body are paralyzed in REM sleep so that you don't fall out of a tree or call out, tiger, any tigers in the woods tonight, you know, right? So uh, we don't get a full response of the motor system except for a few exceptions like the eye movements and, well, you'll think of some others. But so here's a case where we are, have electro, we're trying to also push micro switches as a means of signaling, which never worked. But what we, when we put electrodes on the forearms and then in the dream press the micro switch, we could find small twitches of the EMG corresponding to the effort. The muscles are suppressed, but not always completely so, right? So here, what the task is, uh, I'm the subject in this case, and I make a signal, and with the left, 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 which is dots for Morse code, and then left, right, left, left, which is dot, 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 dash, dot, dot, SL, which were my initials, the idea uh, as an additional point that, yes, communication is possible, volitional sequences of unlikely patterns are possible, and it was an answer to the superstition that you can't say your name in a dream without waking up. Very briefly, we collected 
about 78 lucid dreams in the laboratory, all marked with signals. We knew when they happened. So we, from 13 different subjects, and we analyzed the physiology. And back in the early 80s, the easiest physiology to um, analyze was autonomic physiology um, from the paper and measurements like that. It was really before computers were uh, in an easy-to-use form. And here we see, though, the eye movement signal right there, and we'll look what happens to the autonomic nervous system immediately before the onset of the lucid dream. That the respiration rate goes from slow and regular to rapid and regular and shallow. The finger pulse amplitude drops immediately. There is a skin potential response up in the scalp, all indicating a sympathetic activation. So we lined up our 78 lucid dreams Average them all together, and here's the grand average. I'll only, I don't even have time to fully explain this one, but I say this is the eye movement density, and we're seeing uh, each bar is 30 seconds. So the white bars are the 30 seconds before the lucid dreams began, and the ones after the center line there are the lucid dream. And you see, first of all, that in the lucid dream, there's a much higher level of eye movement activity than in the non lucid part so that the brain is more activated. It also has an increased elevation right before the lucid dream begins, and we think this amounts to a physiological requirement for lucid dreaming, that the brain has to be more activated than it is on the average in REM sleep. There are peaks and valleys of activation of the brain in REM sleep, and it's in the peaks that we have the full capacity available to run that higher level program of meta consciousness. This is all a dream. It's all in my mind somehow. Well, I think just skip over this, uh, but we, have, of course, are doing uh, EEG mapping and trying to figure out which parts of the brain get activated and all. I just want to mention that lucid dreaming is learnable uh, because uh, this wouldn't be of much use to people if there weren't a way of accessing it. And the basic methods of learning lucid dreaming is, number one, to recognize when something odd happens in your dreams. We call them dream signs, things that could tell you you're dreaming, like the hammer hits the glass, and instead of the glass breaking, the hammer breaks. Now, you can uh, get the mental set of saying, I'm going to look at my dreams for the things that could tell me I'm dreaming, and then to prepare my mind that when those occur, I'm going to notice I'm dreaming. And that's a mental set we normally lack, and that's the main reason we don't have lucid dreams each night, is that the physiological potential is there, but we're not sleeping with the right mental set. This is uh, briefly from my uh, three-year uh, dissertation study of lucid dreaming at Stanford, and I learned to have lucid dreams volitionally, and I started stumbling around in the dark, but finally found that memory was the key, that what you have to do is simply say, there's something I want to do tonight, prospective memory, memory for intentions. You can remember to do things later today. Well, tonight there's something you want to do, which is to remember to notice your dreaming an implementation plan helps having a dream sign, saying when this oddity occurs, I'm going to recognize I'm dreaming. Knowing which oddity it's going to be could be a problem, so we tried other ways of getting reminders into the dream while people were dreaming. One way that works pretty well is having, in this case, these were LED goggles that people wore during sleep, and then we'd flash lights while they were dreaming. And if the lights in the room flashed on and off right now, you'd say, ah, oh, the show's start to start. Or you'd say, if your mind were prepared, ah, I must be dreaming because that's the cue telling me I'm dreaming. So we can have specific signs to do that. Now, of course, we have home use uh, sleep masks that do all this for you at home, not needing a lab. Uh, of course, there are drugs that make lucid dreaming easier. You know, take the red pill, not the blue pill, right? So now, what is the red pill going to be? Uh, one, uh, the result that I showed you that lucid dreaming occurs during intensified REM sleep. So there's a hint, let's intensify REM sleep. How do we do that? Well, we give uh, drugs that intensify the REM process, the uh, increased levels of acetylcholine. It turns out that the same drugs that are the most common ones used for Alzheimer's Alzheimer's has a low level of acetylcholine, an important neurotransmitter for consciousness in REM sleep. And we can 
increase that. And so we did a randomized study with 10 subjects with placebo versus a low dose and medium dose of Aricept or Donepazil and found that we got a very substantial increase in lucid dreaming with the stimulating of the REM sleep. And it goes from something like, you know, up by uh, 30 times. It is a very strong effect. Nine out of the 10 subjects had a lucid dream on an experimental night and only one on the control night. So we've got a way of, 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 plus there are many more specific techniques that I haven't got time to go into. They're purely mental and it's possible to learn how to do it and get to it. And I, I, I said in the abstract I was going to mention applications, so I'm saying yes, there are many potential applications. And there's some that are obvious and they're well established and some that are very speculative. Creative play, well, it's, you know, the poor man's Tahiti, it's dream sex, flying, just the thrill of it all, right? And there's something very rewarding about the experience of just waking up in the dream and say, ah, I'm here, my presence, okay? He's going to say, yeah, yeah, I thought so. All right, so, so if only there were time compression, I'd be able to, but there isn't. So I'll just say, all right, rehearsal for living, certainly a simulation, a world simulation, creative problem solving. Uh, Rudy Tanzi was talking about using that as a source of creativity himself uh, the other night. So uh, the idea of healing dream, I'll show you some basis for that. The study of consciousness in its pure state without sensory input. How does the system work when it's left to its own devices? There's a dream yoga spiritual practice that does all of this for us uh, for the last thousand years that can take one to the view that life is a dream. So just a moment of, of our, the idea of what you can do in the laboratory with a lucid dream subject. We can measure how long dreams take. So how long does a dream last? And so in this particular task, we have our subjects Top panel, she's awake, she makes an eye movement signal and counts to 10 seconds, 1,000, 1,000, 2, estimating 10 seconds. Second signal and then estimates 10 without counting. Later that night in REM sleep, she does the same thing exactly in her lucid dream and what do you see? Obviously, it's extremely close. It takes them as much time to do it in the dream as to actually do it. Voluntary control of respiration is... is Likewise possible here, the same paradigm where the subject is breathing rapidly between the first signals and holding his breath in the second. And it shows just as clearly as the eye movement signals because there's no paralysis. Uh, I'll just briefly say that you can do tracking of the thumb, for example. In the waking state, you get something like the perception relatively smooth circle. In imagination, you get a saccadic path, rapid, jerky kind of path, but in lucid dreaming, we get this smoother path. And we can use the average velocity around that circle to discriminate reports from imagination and dreaming, and obviously perception. By the imagination, I have more rapid more saccadic movements in them. So it seems to be a way of measuring the vividness of the experience, because that's presumably the difference. Now, just a few words about nightmares for uh, those people in the audience who, who care about the sort of spiritual dimension of it. This is the common view of nightmares, which is, uh, here's the poor suffering victim, nothing he can do about these devils who are beating him with clubs for no good reason, right? So. Uh, he's just got to get through it. But we, uh, the great Gary Larson guru, tells us how to handle it. A different frame, which is, calm down, Edna. Yes, it's some giant hideous insect, but it could be a giant hideous insect in need of help. <laughs> right? And that's the way you can reframe the dream of the lucid dreaming. You can say, okay, I don't, yes, I'm, it's a frightening experience, but I can look at it differently. Suppose I change my perspective and say, here's an occasion where I'm going to help this creature. And after all, it could well be Gregor Samza, you know, from Kafka, you know, looking for a cup of sugar from next door. But most people don't do that. Most people, when they realize they're in a nightmare, what do they do? They wake up, right? Is that a good idea? Well, when you do that, what's happening is you uh, 
do this. I go, go back to sleep, Chuck. You're just having a nightmare. Of course, we are still in hell. You see, the problem is if you wake up to get away from a part of yourself, then what are you doing? You're just sweeping it under the rug. It's still there. It's still something that needs to be dealt with. So let's see, I'll, I'll just say there is a yoga of the dream state, and many of you know about it, and there are details. Mainly the idea of becoming lucid, which I've told you can be done uh, readily, realizing that the nature of the experience, when you see something in a dream, it's the same as when you see it in the wake. In state. It's just like the demonstration of the blind spot. Remember you saw what was behind there? Well, it wasn't labeled, you know, with a little marching ants around or blinking somehow. It was the same stuff as the other stuff. It's all the same stuff. It's all the stuff of consciousness, so to speak. It's in your mind. So this whole world that you're seeing around this room is your mind. It's not the physical world. It can't be. So the dream yoga you know, conclusion from all of this is that our truest life is when we are in dreams awake. And that's the possibilities that lucid dreaming offer. And I think I'm just going to stop there in order to respect the constraints of non-dream time. So, thank you.